Well, today we're starting a new series of messages called Overcoming Spiritual Stagnation. And I read something by a guy named Travis Agnew that kind of gave me the idea for the series. So I'm not doing what he did, but I feel like that he did enough insight and got me going that he deserves to be, uh, be mentioned here. Here's the issue. is no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, stagnation can be a problem. Stagnation can be a problem. Maybe you have even started your spiritual journey, and so certainly you're stagnant because you haven't even got going on the journey. But maybe you got off to a good start, and you took off real well, and you had a lot of momentum, but something's happened. All of a sudden, there's not that same momentum towards spiritual growth and interest in spiritual things. You become stagnant. Or maybe you've been following Jesus for a long time, and things have been going very well for years, and you're faithful, but you've hit kind of a, a, kind of a dry point. Regardless of why it is, spiritual stagnation is a big problem. And maybe you haven't even thought about it, that you're really on a journey. Because the truth of the matter is, we are all on a spiritual journey. When you were conceived, you received both a spiritual life and physical life. And so from that point on, you've been on a journey. It was the beginning of your physical journey and your spiritual journey. And, you know, it happens not when you were born. It happens in conception. There's many places in Scripture where God talks about knowing us and being us while we were still in the womb before we were born. One example is Isaiah 44, 24. It says, this is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by myself. God talks about forming you and knowing you in the womb because your spiritual life and your physical life began there. You were you before you were born. Your spiritual journey began the moment you're conceived, and it keeps on going from that point on. And it reaches an end. Now, our spiritual life doesn't end at death, but our physical life does. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says it this way. And the dust returns to the ground at death. The dust returns to the ground it came from. Remember, Adam was made from the dust of the ground. So at death, we go back to the ground. But, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. You know, death is not the end of our existence. Death is the end of the connection between our spirit and the body. But our spirit lives on afterwards. So our spiritual journey doesn't end at death. Death is not the end of our existence. It's simply the end of our bodily existence, which we'll once again have when there's a resurrection that takes place. And you know what? Every single person is going to be resurrected. Sometimes we think that only the righteous, only the godly are going to be resurrected, but Scripture says that all will be resurrected because all will eventually face judgment. And in a sense, that might be where our spiritual journey finally actually ends. John chapter 5, verses 28 through 29 says it this way, Jesus speaking, don't be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to life, and those who have done what is evil will, be, will rise to be condemned. You see, we're all on a spiritual journey. It starts when we're conceived. Death's kind of a transition point. But the big thing comes at judgment. And you know what? We want to make sure that we avoid stagnation while we're on that spiritual journey. We want to keep going. We want to keep moving toward what God wants. Spiritual stagnation prevents us from reaching our journey's full definition. You see, returning to God is part of that, but it's not everything that God has in mind for us as a spiritual def destination. We're going to talk about that some more in just a minute. But first of all, I want to talk about stagnation because stagnation is a problem. Now, a basic definition of stagnation might go something like this. It's the state of not flowing or not moving. When something stops flowing or moving, it's called being stagnant. And a lot of times we think of stagnation mainly in terms of water. When water is stagnant, it just sits there. It just stands there. It doesn't flow. It doesn't move. But, you know, I think really we need to add something to that definition. Stagnation is a state of not flowing or moving toward the desired destination. You know, stagnant water can move. You know, when you go for a walk sometimes, you might go by a stagnant bunch of water, and if you kid throw rocks in there, the water's going to move. There'll be some motion, but it's not moving toward a destination. It's not flowing toward a destination. Stagnant water can move, but it doesn't move the way it's supposed to move. It doesn't move to a desired location. It just sits there. Stagnation. Think, have you ever thought about stagnant water? 
Have you ever been by stagnant water? It just sits there. It doesn't flow. It doesn't move. And because it just sits there, it becomes a problem. If you get around stagnant water, oftentimes it smells kind of bad. There's a bit of an odor there because there's a lot of decay that takes place around stagnant water. If you're around stagnant water, sometimes it looks kind of bad. It looks like there's just decay there and it looks dark there. You know, stagnant water is dangerous. It can cause health problems. Bacteria grows in stagnant water. Stagnant water is the perfect place for bacteria to grow. And, you know, there are some varieties of bacteria that are actually very dangerous. Not all, but some types of bacteria are very dangerous. So you've got to make sure you don't drink stagnant water. And if you touch it, you want to make sure you wash your hands before you touch something else because that bacteria can make you sick and can make other people sick. You know what else grows around stagnant water? Mold. Mold. Stagnant water can produce mold, and mold in homes especially can be a problem because there's that musty smell that comes from mold, and, and some molds are just very dangerous to your health. You don't want to inhale them because they can make you sick. Now, mold can be removed, but what you want to do is you want to get rid of the stagnant water because if you remove the mold and don't deal with the stagnant water, the mold will come back. How about insects? Insects love stagnant water. We're getting into that time in New York where they tell you to watch out for the stagnant water that's around there because what's going to happen? The mosquitoes are going to come and they're going to lay their eggs and they breed in stagnant water. That's the kind of water they like. And we don't want insects. We don't want mosquitoes because mosquitoes carry diseases like the Zika virus and West Nile and malaria. So what do you want to do to get rid of those mosquitoes? You've got to get rid of the stagnant water. We can't have stagnant water. Of course, mosquitoes and insects aren't the only problem. Vermin, mice and rats, and if you live in the country, possums, they're attracted to stand, stagnant standing water. They're looking for the source, and of course, you don't want them around either. You see, there are some physical problems related to stagnant water, but you know what? You can have stagnation in other areas of your life. It's not uncommon to hear people talk about economic stagnation. And what happens with economic stagnation? There's not jobs, and people don't have jobs to pay their bills. There's no growth in the economy, so there's no tax revenue to pay for the services. So we don't like economic stagnation. But you don't like stagnation in other areas. As an artist, you don't want to be stagnant. You want to be keep moving and doing things new. You don't want your sports team to be stagnant. You don't want your lives to be stagnant. Stagnation comes when, well, there's just nothing really interesting in life. Nothing exciting. The daily routine just seems kind of mundane and boring. Now, you can see where stagnation is a problem in other areas of life, but stagnation is a big problem when we get to the spiritual area of our life. Spiritual stagnation produces unhealthy spiritual lives, just like stagnant water produces unhealthy lives. And spiritual stagnation takes place when there what? There's no movement. There's no movement toward God. You see, you want to not have water standing. You want to have it moving. And you want our lives not just to be standing still. You want our lives to be moving toward God. In practical terms, water generally flows toward the ocean, right? The oceans are the lowest parts, about sea level. And so when rain falls, the water falls, it runs down the hillsides, it runs down to the rivers, the creeks, the streams, and it flows toward the ocean. That's the goal, but sometimes a, a, a river will flow into a lake, and that lake doesn't flow out. Most lakes flow out. There's other places that flow out. And that's when you get the problem of stagnant water, when there's no way for the water that flows in one destination to flow out. Many of you are familiar with the contrast between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. The Sea of Galilee is in the northern part of Israel. The Dead Sea is kind of in the southern part. And you know what? They're connected by a river, by the Jordan River. Water, rainwater from the mountains in the north flow into the Sea of Galilee, the Lake of Galilee, and it fills it up and it flows out the Jordan River and it flows down toward the lower part, which is the Dead Sea. But you know what? There's no place for the water in the Dead Sea to flow. It just stays there. And it doesn't get stagnant like we think of stagnant because uh, plants don't grow there, but it gets really, really, really filled with salt. It's so salty that life will not grow in it. That's why there's no plants growing there. It's so salty that around it no vegetation grows because the water flows in, but it doesn't flow out. It just sits there, and so it causes death. Well, think about us. What should our lives flow toward? If rain falls down and flows toward the ocean naturally, our lives, our spirit should naturally be drawn toward God. Because we were created by God and for God, it would be natural for us to want to go toward Him, and we will 
unless there are some spiritual low spots, just like there are some physical low spots. And those spiritual low, low spots are things that keep us from drawing close to God. God wants us to move toward his destination and toward him. But there are sometimes things in our lives, sin and apathy, that keep us from being and flowing toward God. God wants us not just to return to him. God wants us to return to him in a very special way. You see, spiritual stagnation occurs when we don't move toward God and move toward God's desired destination for us. Just like water gets stagnant when it doesn't move to where it's supposed to go, the ocean just sits there and insects and disease and bacteria grows, we will be stagnant if we don't move toward God's desired destination for us. Now, God's desired destination for us is that we are with him, but he wants us with him in a certain way. Everybody's going to return back to God, the righteous and the unrighteous, but there's a specific way that God wants us to return to him. And Paul talks about that in Colossians chapter 1, verses 27 through 29. Let me read those for you. Paul speaking here to the Colossians. He's talking to them, God's people, and here's what he says. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of his, this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let's pay a special attention to verse 28. He, Christ, is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. So earlier in this passage, Paul makes the point that Jesus died on the cross so he could present people to God free from sin, blameless, holy, completely forgiven. We are acceptable to God because of the work that Jesus did on the cross. But here Paul more clearly describes what God's goal for us is. It isn't simply that we will get to heaven, although he wants us to get to heaven, and Jesus died so that was happened. Notice the goal that God has for us is that we would be mature in Christ. Ever thought about what the goal of your life is? It might be your goal of your life is to uh, make some money so you can retire comfortably. And, and that is a goal for your life. I hope Lori and I have set aside enough money so that when we have finally retire completely, we'll be comfortable. But that's not really the big goal of life. Some of us may have a goal in life to get a specific type of job, and you're working your way up the ladder to get that. And it's not a bad goal to have that goal, but that's not really the big goal of life. That's not the spiritual destination. The spiritual destination that God has for us is to be mature in Christ. And you know what? When we have something else as a goal, what's going to happen? We're going to become spiritually stagnant. And all those things that we talked about can happen bad when we're stagnant can happen to us. Now, notice the desired goal, the desired destination is maturity in Christ. It's not perfect in the sense of being sinless because we're never going to be perfect in the sense of being sinless. But it is to be mature. It is to be mature. And we can all be mature. Being mature is not something that's beyond any of us. Now, it may take time to get there. Certainly, maturity takes time. But it's not something that we cannot achieve. You see, God's desired destination for everyone is that they become fully mature in Christ. That's what our lives should move toward, just like water should move toward the ocean. And if water moves toward the ocean, it won't be stagnant. But if it stops moving toward the ocean, it becomes stagnant and all those problems develop. And you see, our goal, what we need to move toward, our destination is being fully mature in Christ. He doesn't just want us to arrive in heaven in any condition at all. He wants us to arrive in heaven mature in Christ. When you order something, your product from Amazon or somebody else, and it gets to your home, you want it to get there, but you don't want it to get there in any condition. You don't want the box to be deep beat up and the product inside damaged. You want it to arrive fully functioning and fully intact. And see, God's goal for us is certainly, indeed, that he wants us to get to heaven, but he wants more than just that we get to heaven, that we get to heaven fully mature in Jesus Christ. Now I want to talk about verse 28 a little bit more. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. Now, I want to talk about that phrase, in Christ, first, because God wants us to be in Christ. Part of his destiny for us is to be in Christ. God wants people to be mature, certainly, general, physically, and socially. He wants us to be spiritually mature. And you know how you get spiritually mature? You've got to get in Christ to start with. What does in Christ really mean? 
Well, that's a phrase we get in the Bible a lot that we probably don't talk about a lot. A lot of times we'll talk about somebody being a Christian, but you know the word Christian is only used a couple of times in the Bible, but the phrase in Christ is used a lot in the Bible. In fact, in Christ, in the Lord, or in him occurs 164 times in Paul's letters alone. What does it mean to be in Christ? It doesn't mean to be in Christ like tools are in a toolbox or clothes are in a closet. To be in Christ is to have a personal connection, a personal relationship with Jesus. It's the mark of being an authentic follower of Jesus Christ. To be in Christ is to have a saving relationship with Jesus. It means to be in relationship with Christ. Now, you know we all start off being in somebody else besides Christ. We all start off by being in, in Adam because we're all descendants of Adam. And so our natural state is to be in Adam. And, and that's not really a good natural state to be in because, you see, in Adam we have sin. In Adam we have separation from God. But in Christ we have reconciliation to God. In Christ we're back in God's family. In Christ we're back in God's favor. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says it this way, For as in Adam all die, and that's all die the consequences of sin, so in Christ we are all made alive. We're made alive spiritually now and will be resurrected when Jesus returns. So to be in Christ means that we have a saving relationship with Christ. We now are brought into union and communion with God in such a way that what is true of Christ becomes true of us. Have you ever thought about that? Scripture says that when you're in Christ, so what's true of Christ becomes true of you. Christ is righteous, so God looks at us as righteous. Christ is beloved by God, so God loves us. All those things that come to Christ comes to us. Honor will come to us. Why? Because we're in Christ. When we die, we'll go to glory. We'll <clears throat> go to God's glory because we're in Christ. His grace, his resources become ours because we are in Christ. We start off as children of Adam, we start off in Adam, but through faith in Jesus and his work on the cross, we get in Christ, and so the blessings of his come to us. Galatians chapter 3 describes it this way, in Galatians 3, 26 to 28, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. You get in Christ through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This passage says that we become in Christ by faith at baptism. Being in Christ, though, is not our complete destination. It's an important part of our destination, but it's not all of our destination. Let's look again at Colossians 1.28. He wants to present everyone fully mature in Christ. You know, when you get in Christ, you know what happens? You start off as a spiritual infant. You know, it's, that's where you start. You're learning spiritual truths. You're learning spiritual lives. You're learning how to live a different way. You've been, you're mature in Adam, right? You've learned how to live in sin and self-centeredness. Now you've got to be born again and you start in Christ, and so you have to begin to change. And as you grow, you move from being a spiritual infant to a spiritual, spiritual child, a young adult, finally an adult, and even parents. But what does it really mean to be mature in Christ? Looked that up a little bit, and here's one thing that one person wrote. He says, maturity in Christ is this. To be spiritually mature means you organize your life around Jesus, his character, his call to serve, his death on the cross for your sin. Your abilities and gifts may be diverse, but each of us has the power then to be in Christ and then to influence other people to follow Christ. Each of us has the ability to grow in Christ's likeness, to become more like Jesus in our character, and to live a life of faithful service. If we live in this world, and we do, being in Christ means that we will mix well with other people because we feel love and compassion toward other people. But we will also be careful spiritually so that we don't get trapped in sin. We know we have availability, God's wisdom, God's compassion, God's perseverance. And so when we're mature, we'll be people who manifest the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the patience, the kindness, and so on. You see, that's God's destination for you. And making that your destination is how you avoid stagnation. Because if you have some other destination in mind, you're either going to be stagnant or you're going to flow in the wrong direction. 
God's destination is for you. The question is, is that destination the destination you have for yourself? Scripture talks about this in other ways. Romans 8 is another great one. Romans 8, starting at verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God, well, I like that verse. You like that verse? God works all things together for good? I don't know about you, but that's the verse that we, people, we usually memorize pretty early in our spiritual life. And there are some times in my life, and I can remember one very clearly, where I could not go to sleep from worry about something. You know how I got to sleep? I kept repeating this verse over and over and over again until I fell asleep. So that's a good verse, called according to his purpose. Verse 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. You see, everyone's spiritual life starts at conception. God knows in advance those that will believe in him. He has predetermined their destination. But notice the destination that this passage specifically says is predetermined. What is that? It is to be conformed to the image of his son. That means to be mature in Christ. You see, the destination that God has for you is to be saved, to spend eternity with God, first in heaven and then on the new earth he makes. But it's more than just being at that destination. It's being that destination in a specific condition. And that condition is maturity in Christ. That condition is being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. God wants us to have a saving relationship, but God doesn't want us to stay spiritual infants. You know what spiritual infants are like? They're like physical infants. And what are physical infants like? It's all about me. It's all about my wants, my desires, my needs. He wants us to grow up and mature and to be fully mature in Christ. Remember, we're not saved by our level of maturity. I'm, you know, I'm talking about today growing up and being mature in Christ and not what God's want. There's not some point that if you mature a point enough, you're going to be saved. No, you're saved by faith in Jesus. You don't earn it. You don't must it, um, deserve it. Whether you're a spiritual infant or a spiritual grandparent, you're not saved by how mature you are. You're saved by what Jesus wants. But nonetheless, we want to make sure that we do what God wants. And what God wants is for us to mature, to grow up. And the way we avoid stagnation is making that our goal. You see, if that's not our goal, it's going to be very easy for us to become stagnant. It's going to become for us to look inside and think only about our wants, our desires, and therefore we'll get stagnant. We'll stop moving toward the goal that God has for us, just like water will stop moving toward the place it's supposed to be and stays where it's at and gets stagnant. We're not saved by maturity, but we are saved to become mature. We're not saved by good works. We're saved for good works. We are saved by being faithful and spiritual stagnation comes because too many people have got a partial gospel. We think the gospel is only about being saved and get the go to heaven card when you die. But the gospel is good news. It's about being changed right now and living a new life right now with Jesus as your Lord and your Savior and having a transformation of your character so that we become mature like Jesus Christ is. Now, the decision not to grow is a decision too many people make. They believe and say, I'm going to heaven, and they just say, that's it. I'll sit on the sidelines. I'll just be stagnant. I'll just sit here. But the real ministry of the gospel is you get saved so you can grow and you can mature. It's important that people realize that when they put their faith in Jesus, it's not a one-time transaction where they say certain words or get baptized, and it's done. That's the beginning point of a growing relationship with God that leads to spiritual maturity. And I'm frightened because too many people don't make that decision, become stagnant in their spiritual life. And I think because of that stagnation, there are those that just simply fall away. Well, one more thing. What's going on here? He wants us to be in Christ. He wants us to be mature in Christ. But notice the passage says we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. Everyone. God does not want just a few people to be in Christ. He wants everyone here. He doesn't want just a few people to reach maturity. He wants everyone to reach maturity. He wants everyone here to be in Christ, and he wants everyone here to be mature. Now, let me read uh, Colossians 1.28 from a more literal translation of the Bible, the New American Standard Bible, because I want you to point out something there about what goes on. Here's the verse, the way it translated. We proclaim him, that's Jesus, admonishing every person and teaching every person with all wisdom so we may present every person complete in Christ. 
Now, some of the translations only have two every persons in there. They kind of put together admonishing and teaching everyone and just kind of put it together. But when you literally, he's saying three times every person, we had proclaim him, admonish every person, teach every person, so we represent every person complete in Christ. Notice how much he emphasizes that this desire is for everybody. You might say, oh, me, I'm saved, I'm still going to go to heaven, that's all I care about. I'm not going to worry about being mature. I'm not going to worry about growing. That's not God's plan. God wants everyone to grow, everyone to mature, not just some people. God wants everyone to be saved. First Timothy 4, 2, 2, 4 says this, he wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. From the beginning, at creation, God wanted everyone to be close to him. That's what the garden was. The garden was a place for God and people to hang out. We think it was just a place for people to live and eat. But no, it was a rendezvous point for God. And God wanted the people in the garden to have maturity, spiritual maturity, the character of Christ. And they would have had it if they hadn't rebelled against God and sinned. Jesus, God has been at work from the fall, from the rebellion, to restore people to him and restore people to spiritual maturity. That, pl that plan and, and that plot that God had, Jesus was the pivotal event in that process because Jesus brought forgiveness and new life so we can be restored to the image of God. And so we can begin this process of spiritual transformation so we can be mature in Christ. And that's what God wants us to move forward move toward maturity in christ now people always don't always reach it because some start some don't start the journey and because some start the journey and stop halfway along the journey they become stagnant so our biggest problem is spiritual stagnation not either getting in christ and beginning that journey or getting stagnant along the way and spiritual stagnation is the result of not being in christ and not moving towards spiritual maturity those are two problems people have some people don't get in christ so they can't move toward maturity in Christ. And some have gotten there, but they've not made maturity a goal of theirs. Some people are spiritually stagnant because they're not in Christ. And you know why people aren't in Christ? They just don't see the need. Somehow they think their lives are just fine. Yeah, things are going well. They've got a good job they like. They've got friends. They've got family. They're happy. Others don't see a need for Christ because although their life's not that all that good, they just don't really have a desire to make a change, to orient their lives around Jesus and not orient their lives around themselves. They prefer to live for themselves and their desires, their self-chosen destination, rather than God's chosen destination for them. There are people like that, but they don't realize that they need to be in Christ. They're unaware of the benefits that come from being Christ. And you know, their unawareness is exactly why Paul says, what does Paul say? He proclaims Christ. Why would you proclaim Christ? Because there's some people that just don't get it. They don't realize the need they have for Christ, so they don't put their faith in Christ. Why would he say he admonishes and teaches everyone? Because same time people don't get it. They don't understand the maturity in Christ is the goal that they should be moving for. So he has to admonish them and he has to teach them so that they will do these things. You probably heard about this or maybe it's happened to you you feel just fine everything's going great in your life but you know it's time for your annual doctor's appointment and so you go in and they run the blood work and they do a few tests and they come back to you and say you may not be aware of this but you've got a serious health problem and you didn't know about it or the person that you talked to didn't know about it because outwardly everything seemed fine but inwardly there was a problem growing that needed to be dealt with i remember my sister charlotte um, she had cancer. And you know how she discovered she had cancer? She was on the sailboat with her husband, and because the boat jostled around a little, little bit, uh, she kind of fell against something and got bruised and had to go to the doctor, and they ran tests, and they found the cancer. Didn't know it wasn't there, wasn't aware of it, but it was there all along. You see, there are people who are not moving toward God's destination for them to be in Christ, to have their sins forgiven, to live a life in which they want to become mature in Jesus Christ because they just don't realize they have a need. They don't have a need. They think everything's fine. But there is a problem because apart from Jesus, we are, we're dead in our sins. We need forgiveness. We need a new life. And so we need to get in Jesus. Otherwise, we're stagnant and separate from God. As we talked about a few weeks ago, Jesus said this in John 14, 6. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. It's only through Jesus 
that our sins are forgiven and we're given a new life. Only through Jesus that our character begins to be transformed and changed so we no longer live in fear. We no longer live in selfishness. We no longer live for ourselves. We begin to live for God and have the blessings that come from that. It's, and many people kind of want to believe in God, but they don't want to surrender to God. Jesus says this in Matthew 16, starting at verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? You see, overcoming spiritual stagnation starts by being in Christ, by becoming a follower of Christ, by surrendering to Christ, by giving your priority in your life to Christ, not to yourself. People can do that, and some people have done that. They've been forgiven, but they're still somewhat stagnant in their spiritual life. And that's because they're not moving toward maturity in Christ. You see, some people say, I want forgiveness, I want to be cleansed, I want to know I'm going to heaven, but I don't want to change. I want to just stay the way I am before. Well, they think the job is finished at the moment of salvation, and they need to realize that that's the beginning of the work. That's the beginning of the transformation of the character. God does his saving work, but he invites us to join him in the maturing work that takes part in our life. God works in our life. He changes our desires, but there's still a degree to which we cooperate with that. That's why there's commands in scriptures. If we didn't have to cooperate with this, if we had no role to play in this, there would be no commands in scripture for us to respond to and fulfill. Simply saying the words, I believe in Jesus, or being baptized is good and important, the first step, but it's got to be followed up with a commitment to mature and grow in Jesus Christ. Believers need to prog pro make progress from their initial claim of faith and declaration of faith to a growth in faith. Too many say yes to forgiveness, but no to denying themselves. And unless we deny ourselves, we won't mature. We won't mature. Think about it for a minute. God is gracious to us. He's kind to us. He treats us better than we deserve, even though we don't deny ourselves, even though we don't pursue Jesus the way we should, even though we don't move toward being mature in Christ. God is still good to us and does lots of things in our life, answers our prayer. But that doesn't change the fact that what he wants most is for us to be fully mature in Jesus Christ. And that takes a measure of effort. That makes it takes a measure of self-denial. God is not our flunky. He's not a genie that fulfills our wishes. If we think God exists for us in our agenda, agenda you know what's going to happen? We're going to hit a wall spiritually. We're going to get stagnant spiritually. Because although God blesses us, there will become times in our life in which we will not get what we want in life. And we'll get frustrated. We'll be unfulfilled. We can be resentful and bitter toward God if we have this attitude that God exists to make my life go smooth and give me everything that I want. Some people, when they hit that, they just get stagnant. Other people drift away in their faith. But that's, that's unfortunate because you know what? Those are the points when we can mature in Christ the most. You know, there's just a whole sense. If you change the destination of what you're moving toward, it can change everything in your life. Because, see, if you're only moving toward everything going smooth in your life, it's going to have something bad going to happen. You're eventually going to get sick, and you're going to die. There's someone you love is going to get sick, and they're going to die. There are many times God intervenes and blesses us and makes us well, and of course, but there are going to be some hard times. And if we don't get a change in our destination of life being always the way I want to my destination to be spiritually mature, we're going to hit some of those points, and they're going to be rough. But if you change your destination... If you change what you're moving toward and make that spiritual maturity, it's going to change your perspective on everything in life. Because you know what? When something bad happens, that's an opportunity for what? For you to become mature in Christ. For you to grow in Christ. Self-fulfillment is your goal. You will struggle because things will not always go the way you want. But if maturity in Christ is your goal, every single circumstance gives you the opportunity to mature in Jesus Christ. Everything that happens to you, success or failure, can be a way in which you can say, how am I going to respond to this the way that Jesus would respond to this so that I will grow more? Now, if you're successful, I hope you are successful. I know you are successful at the time. What should you do? You should thank God, right? 
You should thank God for the success that's coming. You should show appreciation and gratitude, and you'll mature because you're not claiming the credit for yourself. You're giving God the glory and God the praise. If you're successful, it's going to put you in contact with a new, new group of people, somebody different that you can share your faith with and help get them started on a spiritual journey. Success is a place for you to grow in your faith and mature, but failure oftentimes is more so because failure is when you have to trust God. You have to depend upon God. You've got to say, God, I don't understand why this is the case, but I trust that you know what's best, and therefore I will depend upon you. It's a time in which you can pause and say, am I living for you or am I living for me? Because sometimes the, 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 the time of living for, uh, dealing with your, your failure gives you an opportunity to live for God in a way that success doesn't. I think I mentioned that Valerie's been in the hospital. She had some gall gallbladder surgery, and she's recovering for that. And she was talking about, you know, beforehand, our small group about, you know, not really looking forward to having an operation. And she says, you know, I don't really look for that. I wish God would just heal me, and I wouldn't have to have this gallbladder operation. But you know what? I'm just going to say that everybody that I'm going to meet while I have this surgery is somebody I wouldn't have met otherwise. And everybody I'm going to meet, I'm going to try the best I can to say a word for Jesus while I'm there. You see, when you change your perspective on life, if you change the goal, if you change what you're flowing toward, every single thing that happens can help you achieve your goal of being mature in Jesus Christ. And sometimes the things that are the hardest help you the most. I know that's happened in our small group. We've talked about this, and people have talked about how there was tough things going on in their life they didn't like. There were prayers that were not answered when they wanted, how they wanted, and they were frustrated by that at the time, but they look back on that, and they say, that's the time I got the closest to God. That's a time in which I depended upon him and leaned on him. That's a time in which I created a relationship with God that sustains me and helps me at all the times. We grow the most, we mature the most in the hard times. We can in good times too. I don't want to say not. I want more good times than hard times, let me tell you, right? Don't we all want that? But the truth of the matter is that there will be some hard times and we can grow and mature in theirs. You never run out of opportunities to mature in Christ. If success and comfort on your goal, then stagnation, it'll come. It'll be hard sometimes, and you can drift away, or you can plateau or go backwards in your relationship with God. But if maturity in Christ is your goal, everything can help you accomplish that goal. And therefore, there's nothing that should cause stagnation if you always respond with seeing, how can I mature, how can I grow in this circumstance? Paul knew that. You always wonder how it is that Paul could say what he says here in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. He's thanking the Philippian church because they sent him some money to help him in his ministry and support him. And here's what he says in Philippians 4, 11 and 13. I'm not saying this, that's thank you, because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Have you learned to be content whatever the circumstances? I'm working on it. Here's what he says. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I know what it's like to fail. I know what it's like to succeed. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Why could Paul be content in any circumstance? Because having the best circumstances was not the goal of his life. The goal of his life was maturity in Christ. And every circumstance was a possibility for him to grow and be mature in Jesus Christ. He talked about being wing, wing well fed and hungry. I've never been hungry in the sense that I've extended a period of time. Maybe I'm hungry because, you know, it's, it's hour before supper. But think about that. Being content when you are hungry to the point of really lacking food. Why is he able to do that? Because his goal was different. He never got stagnant. He always kept flowing and moving toward God. We can do that, too. You know, Paul was actually thankful when he was in prison. Can you imagine being thankful that you were preaching Jesus Christ, you were persecuted, beaten, and you were thrown into prison? I would not be thankful. I'd be complaining. I would say, God, here I am serving you, and this is what you do to me? But not Paul. Why was he thankful? Because his goal was the right goal. He wanted to mature in Christ. He wanted to advance the gospel of Christ. And so in prison, he got to spend time with guards, prison guards he never would have seen otherwise. They would never have come. Oh, we're having church on Sunday. Come visit us. They weren't going to come. But because he was in prison, he was able to talk to them. He's learned the secret of being content in all circumstances. Now, I, I don't mean to talk about this a lot, but the fact of the matter is I'm getting older, right? I'm 64. I'm going to be 65 next month. And, you know, there's a temptation as you get older to kind of, well, kind of plateau. 
you know, you reached a certain point, you're just going to kind of coast from there. You're just going to kind of get a little bit stagnant there. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I learn new things, and sometimes when I learn new things, I say, boy, I wish I would have done this differently, or our church was doing this differently. And so there's a little temptation to say, I'm not going to try to learn something new or do something different, because if you do that, you're kind of saying, well, you didn't do it right before, and you're going to have to change and learn a new way. I'm, I'm old enough that, you know, I'm, I'm past that. I'm, you know, my time for change and doing different is over. But it's not. None of my goal is to be mature in Jesus Christ. My goal is to be mature in Jesus Christ. It does not matter how old I get. If I learn something new, I do something new because otherwise I'm going to become stagnant. And the goal in life is not just to get by. The goal in life is maturity in Jesus Christ and no one will reach complete maturity. We can always grow a little bit more even if we are mature. I'm not going to say I'm at this point and therefore I'm just going to coast. I'm not going to get to a point where I'm going to just be stagnant. As long as I'm alive, no matter what's going on and how old I get and what my health decline, my goal is always going to be to be mature in Jesus Christ and use every single opportunities and occasion to grow in my faith and help other people grow in their faith. I had a, oh my goodness, I'm going really long here. I didn't realize it was this long. I even cut stuff out. Well, anyway, let me rush on ahead. I'll save that for next week. <laughs> Spiritual stagnation is a problem. It's a problem. People don't even start the spiritual journey because they're stagnant. People on their spiritual journey, they kind of coast, they kind of plateau, they tread water. And some of you can hang out there, but some people don't do that. They kind of give up. To overcome spiritual stagnation, you must choose and move. You must choose to be in Christ, and you must choose to make spiritual maturity your destination. Not just to go to heaven when you die, but to be mature now, and then you've got to move toward maturity in Christ. You've got to take action, and we're going to talk about how to take action throughout the rest of the series of messages. But today, let me just wrap up with this, to ask you, what is the destination that you have chosen for your life that you are moving toward? Now, you can have more than one. There's nothing wrong with having some destinations for your job or your family. No, those, are all good. those are secondary destinations. Those are secondary goals. What is the primary goal in your life that you are moving toward? I think I know most of you here today, and I think most of you are in Christ, so you've already made that choice. What I would encourage you to do is to make sure that you've made that second choice, and that choice is to be mature in Jesus Christ. Not just in Christ, but mature in Jesus Christ. And to be like Paul, as someone who was a mature in Jesus Christ, to say, I'm going to help other people to be mature in Jesus Christ as well. We'll talk more about that. Why don't you stand with me as we pray? And if you would like prayer, we invite you to come to the front. If you need to get in Christ to learn how you can become a follower of Jesus, we invite you to come as well. You've got your connection card, both online and here, that you can fill out and complete encourage you to use that but right now let's pray and then sing a response song <laughs>